Welcome to Fellowship Safaris, conversations about people of color and their journeys to subspecialist training in their countries of origin and around the world. Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Jerry Kariajahe. I'm an adolescent medicine specialist and consultant pediatrician. Welcome to this week's episode of Fellowship Safaris podcast. Last week, we were having a conversation with Dr. Dan Ocheng, who was telling us the story right from the beginning in terms of his medical education journey. If you haven't had a chance to take a listen, I highly recommend you getting back to your playlist, listening to that part, and then joining us as we continue on this safari. How did you land on, like now, the next chapter of your professional life? What happened? So... It was a bit of an anticlimax, as I said. So, you yeah. know what? The, the, the motto in Kenya is uh, so many mutapata kazinzuri uh, afterwards, you know, and it was always yeah. like, I am a neurosurgeon. I've arrived. The yeah. world needs to recognize that I have landed. Yeah. And you land and no one gives a hoot and you're just another number and you're just mm. another body in the street. Mm. And realize that, you know what? Life is different. This yeah. is adulting 101. Yeah. You need to survive. You need to provide food on the table. You need to have a roof over your head. Yeah. Provide clothes for your wife and family. And then you need to then grow in a professional atmosphere. Yeah. And I was like, you know what? This needs to get better. So Mm -hmm. I ended up actually doing PLAB exams during that time. Yeah. PLAB exams are the assessment tests to be able to practice in the UK. Yeah. And then at the same time, I also put in applications to also practice in Australia as well. I was able to pass my exams for the UK. And then was able to apply for jobs in the UK. And then I got a pediatric neurosurgery fellowship in London. So oh, wow. February of 2018, packed my bags again after living with my in-laws for about a month, which was also another <laughs> tricky situation. Wow. Um, mm-hmm. Packed my bags, my wife and my kid, and then ended up arrived in London in March uh, 1st, 2019. Wow. Start, to start a PEDS Neurosurgery Fellowship. To start a PEDS Neurosurgery Fellowship, yeah. So how was that transition? Because you've talked about learning and working in the Kenyan medical you know, system and then going to the South African medical system. And then now you're in the UK medical system. How was that transition for you? So it culture... At least English was a common language. Driving on the mm. right side of the road was fine. <laughs> on the correct yeah. side of the road was okay. Yeah. Then I check into the hospital and the first time I'm on call, they tell me there's this neurosurgical patient who's dropped GCS. I look at the scan. They have something called a, a colloid cyst, which mm. then causes uh, hydrocephalus and raised pressure. Yeah. I go in, the patient is unconscious. And I'm like, you know what? Patient is unconscious. Can you pass me a tube? I need to intubate this patient. I need to take this patient to surgery. Yeah. And everyone looks at me like, you are crazy. You can't do that. What do you mean you can't do that? They're like, yeah. no, 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 no. Doctor, if a patient is unconscious, you need to call the anesthetist. The anesthetist needs to come, prescribe the drugs. Only the anesthetist can intubate. And huh? they're like, that different from what? Because in Kenya, and we don't appreciate this about the Kenyan system. Yeah. In as much as you're a pediatrician, you're a neurosurgeon, whatever specialty is, you have a very core general background. Yes. And if worst comes to the worst, you can sort out a lot of general things. But then here I come to what is supposed to be the first world. Yeah. I have a patient who is literally dying in front of me. Yeah. But no one will allow me to intubate. No one will even give me the tube yeah. because I am not an anesthetist. And therefore I have to wait 10, 15 minutes for the anesthetist to come. And intubate. Exactly. Wow. Before the patient can go. So it was a bit of a culture shock. And yes, it's very keen on safety and it helps a lot. Yeah. But in cases of emergency and in cases of where things need to move fast, yeah, the system is a little bit um, slow and a bit unforgiving mm. because everyone thinks two days later when everyone looks through what happened, yeah. can you defend your actions? Will I be sued? Which is not a question I ask myself when I'm back home. Yeah. But when you're in the UK or abroad, then everyone asks what are the legal consequences? Yeah. Do you have the competencies? 
yes, you're a surgeon. What gave you the right to be able to intubate this patient? Yeah. And people will just, you know what? It's outside my lane. I'll wait for the proper person to do it, even though it takes 10, 15 minutes, even yeah. though there are diverse yeah, outcomes. So yeah, that was a big, big learning point for me. Yeah. Oh, wow. And I think, especially when you've been practicing as long as you've been practicing, that transition back to sort of like the learner role is something even me, I was just like, but then we can make this decision. And then everyone's looking at you like, um, no, you're the fellow. Like you have to ask exactly. the staff. And you're like, what? Um, what? <laughs> I know, like that happened to me a couple of times. And I was like, my brain couldn't compute because by the time you're getting to the point of consultant pediatrician, you're the one making certain decisions. It ends with you. And then transitioning from that to you're not the end decision, which for learners is supposed to be a safety net. But for the learner who has been the senior in another setting, it is just so my brain, as in my brain had for a few months getting used to that. And especially when... Your consultant is very well-meaning, yeah. but then you realize yeah. that you have more experience than your consultants, but they've been in this system longer. So they know mm-hmm. the system, they know how to work it. And in a lot of these foreign jurisdictions, they're highly published yeah. and they're very academically, you Google them, the hedge index is great. You go down PubMed, they've yeah. done a lot. Yeah. But then the numbers are not as high in this part of the world as they are back mm-hmm. home. Just having to divide past that fine line for example mm, yeah yeah so oh, wow. i remember like things like things like endoscopy in neurosurgery for example i was trying to teach a registrar to put in a shunt and unfortunately the shunt then she lost her hold of the shunt and the shunt went into the ventricle and my reflex was you know what okay get me a scope put a scope in and i was able to fish it out yeah but then the consultant comes in an hour later and was like, I can't use the scope. I'm not showing you how to use the scope. Why did you use the scope in this picture without calling me? The first step is call for help. <laughs> but I'm like, I've done this before. Yes. Like, no, 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 you've not done this before and you've not signed, been sent for it. And it's just about respecting protocol and how things yeah. are. And I learned, yeah. you know what? Even yeah. though I can do something, yeah. give them a heads up, yeah. do it, but then they'll be able to cover you in case anything goes wrong. It's very right. well-meaning and very yes. understandable. Yeah. But then you just have to learn to adapt to whatever system is around you. Yeah. yeah. And so how long was the pediatric neurosurgery fellowship? The pedi- <laughs> so that <laughs> so pediatric fellowship was a year. Okay. Then at around eight months I started getting the itch and I'm like, it's a great place. I've gotten yes. this line on my C V. Yeah. But but I think I can do more. What am I still doing? And I had an interesting boss. He was very, very good. So actually at that time is when I first did an intrauterine operation for spina bifida. Yeah. So back home, children yeah. with spina bifida, whereby the spinal cord is not fully formed, mm. they'd be born and then you repair it after birth. Yeah. But then this guy developed this new technique whereby he knew that about six to eight months, yeah. he'd uh, do almost a hysterotomy or a mini C section, bring yeah. the child out, repair the spina bifida, then put them back in the uterus so that they developed. And this was really, really groundbreaking. Yeah, And in terms of that, I saw things that I'd never seen before. So it was really, really good. But yeah. then in terms of the routine day-to-day stuff, I was like, I've done this more back home. I, I need to push myself a little bit. And then, yeah. so this guy would, <laughs> he, he'd show up for around at 11 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And then he'd want us to do surgery. And then we'd do exit rounds yes. at about 10 p.m., 11 p.m. at night. What? And I was like, <laughs> Really? Why am I doing rounds at 11 p.m. at night? Yeah. Then I'd have to catch the last train back home. Yeah. I'd come home. My kids were all asleep. My wife was asleep. Then I'd have to leave early again. I'm like, is this the life that I really want? Yeah. So I applied for a consultant position in Oxford. So I got a consultant job in Oxford. So unfortunately yeah. for them, but fortunately for me, there was a consultant who was unwell. Yeah. And then they needed someone to cover for about uh, six months to eight or nine months yeah as a consultant so i applied yeah. and i got and i got the job yeah so here i am end of 2019 i'm like but finally nimefika this is oxford this is and oxford like, hey. dance and over cheering with over the ambo nimefika oxford, oxford. Now I can finally say I'm, oh, I'm an oxford <laughs> consultant <Kamisa. laughs> so i I did that in 2020, uh, end of 2019, beginning yeah. of 2020. 
Yeah. Uh, then I get there, you have the title, you have the space. And then I, you're like, oh, guys, guys they are brilliant, you know? Yeah. Very academic, very cerebral. Yeah. They publish, they are the who and who in the world. Yeah. But then I enjoy surgery. I enjoy the hands-on. I enjoy helping the patients. Yeah. The numbers are a little bit low. So what, what we do there in a month yeah. is equivalent of what we do in Kajabe in a week or less. Wow. Okay. In terms of volume. In terms of volume, yeah. So, yeah. and that's the thing we also don't realize back at home. We really, really have volumes. Yes. But we don't write about what we do. We don't express mm. to the world what we do. Mm. And there's a lot of potential in trying to influence practice from an African point of view. Hey, hey, hey. Say that again. Oh, say that again. No, seriously. Yeah. We can definitely influence practice on the world stage. But I think a lot of time we are either constrained by finances or yeah. we, are, we are just trying to survive right. and just trying to survive the next patient. Yeah. But if you look at the bigger picture, mm. if we all put our heads down to it, five, ten years max, yeah. Africa is the place to be. And Africa will definitely be making uh, the change in medicine. Oh, anyway, wow. so I'm in Oxford for yeah. six, six years. I have it on my CV. It's a check mark. Yeah. Um, I'm doing well. I'm happy. The kids have settled in. Yeah, and then the guy I was replacing then comes back. He's healed, and he's I'm happy healed. for him. But then that <laughs> he's means he's healed now. Yeah, <laughs> and that means <laughs> I'm out of a job. I've been in the UK now. I think a year and a half, almost two years. Right, and I don't have a job. And I'm like, okay, so what do I do now? What do I do now? So I look around, and then there, there are no fellow jobs. There are no consultant jobs, and I have to survive. So I end up applying for a registrar equivalent post. Mm -hmm. So that I can keep my visa intact, otherwise I get deported. And I accept a job in Edinburgh, Scotland. So again, yeah. pick my bugs and mm -hmm. then we move to Scotland. We move to Edinburgh. With your with your wife and now two children? No, one child still. One child still. So, so okay. one child, but but, still. but the missus is pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> but oh. the is pregnant. So. Now she's pregnant. Oh my gosh. So. Hey. Dan, can I just say this is Wait, like a you... movie? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It's, it's uh -huh. looking looking back, looking yeah. back, I'm thinking, Dan, you're stupid or you're crazy. It's one of the two. You a normal person wouldn't do that. Yeah. Oh my so gosh, but yeah. no, no, wait, but you're actually right. Sorry, I'm I'm missing the timeline. So it's actually two kids. So Matthew was born in Cape Town and then McKenna was born in London. And then we moved to Edinburgh. Yeah. And then my wife is pregnant with a third. Wow. So our third child is born in Edinburgh. So I have three children all born in different cities. One born in Cape Town, one born in London, and one, one born in, in Edinburgh. Edinburgh. Three, different <laughs> three different countries. Yeah. Wow. So how was that registrar experience now in Scotland? Oh, man, it was humbling. It was humbling. So I'm like, yeah. I've been a fellow. I've done two fellowships. Right. I've been a consultant. Yeah. And now I've come back to a registrar job. I'm like, what What are you doing? Then just yeah. pack your bags and go home. Why, why are you putting yourself through this? Yeah. But luckily, I looked around, and then that's the time I realized that, you know what? Yeah. People pay and give you more respect when you get the local exams. Mm. So I look around, and I'm like, you know what? Yes, I have my qualification from SA. Yeah. And yes, I have my, my, my experience. But people are like, ah, no, but you haven't passed the UK exams. You don't have a first year. And yeah. I'm like, you know what? Okay, fine. I'll sit down. So for six months, I put my head down. I study for the exams. Uh, I pass my written, and everyone was like, "What do you mean you pass your written? Really? Yeah. Okay. Then I go for the orals. Then I pass my orals, and guys are like, "Are you sure? But you didn't ask us for help. You didn't ask for tips. Yes. And then all of a sudden, people treat you different when they realize, "Oh crap! This guy can do what we do." And this guy has been with us for six months yes. and has already gotten his UK qualification. So I got my FRCS exams then, which was right. good because the registered job, in as much as the day-to-day -day stuff was me then, yeah. I was able to get my paperwork done and I was able to get my UK qualifications done as well. Yes, yes. So I did that. Did that for a year. Scotland yeah. is beautiful. Scotland is amazing. If you get a chance, yeah. please do visit Scotland. Yeah. Um, it gave me a lot of time with family and I was able to, you know, play with the kids, run around and yeah. be there for them. So that, that, that was really, really good. 
which was a good shift from when you'd be finishing your rounds at 10, 11 p.m. <laughs> exactly. And you come and find everyone asleep. <laughs> and again, it goes back to the thing you mentioned much earlier in terms of like the timing of things. And I feel like while on the one hand, yes, you aren't getting like a job, um, you know, post fellowship that's at the level of your training, it also gave you a different opportunity in terms of family and enriching that experience while doing your FRCS. Yes, FRCS, yeah. So now you finish, you're now toe-to-toe with these guys? Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. Then all of a sudden, people give you a little bit more respect. Yeah. Uh, you get a little bit more freedom on what you want to do and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But then the question you always ask yourself, so where do I see myself in a year's time, in two years' time? Right. Is this a job that leads to career progression, mm. more independence, and long-term commitment? Yeah. Or is this just service provision? And then you'll realize that with a lot of, especially in the UK, a lot of registered jobs, yeah. it's a one-year contract. Mm. And every, towards the end of the year, you're busy either trying to see what your next gig is yeah. or what your next opportunity is. And it's pretty much a stressful situation. Mm. Because before you get permanent residency, Yeah then you're always indebted to the job or to the person offering you the opportunity because they, they are the ones who sponsor you to be in the country. And if they woke up one day and said, you know what, we think you're crap, we don't think you need to stay, yeah. then they just say, talk to the home office and a month or so you get out, you're kicked out of the country. What? So that was, always, that was always at the back of my mind. And I was like, you know what? Yes, I love yeah. being here. Yeah. But I hate this. I hate this being dependent on another individual. I need, yeah. hopefully, they can recognize me for the service I bring, for the talent I offer to the table. Right. And not to be one of those people whereby, you know, what if they decided tomorrow that, yeah, he's not fit for purpose, they can kick you out. Yeah. Hey. So I do that for a year. Yeah. And then I'm like, yes, I look around yeah. and I realize, look, wait a minute. The population in the UK is aging. Average life expectancy at that time, I think, was 85 or 90. Yeah. I look at all the referrals that we are getting in. And yes, I trained originally as a scalbis uh, surgeon and then did pediatrics. Yes. But I'm like, wait a minute. Everyone is living longer and longer. Yes. Uh, 60, 70% of the patients we are admitting are old people. Yeah. And here, every, everyone has back pain. Everyone comes with back pain. <laughs> some form of back aging pain. And there's yeah. a problem. <laughs> some form of back pain. Yeah. I'm like, wait a minute. And uh, looking at the jobs and stuff, yeah. everyone's looking for a spine surgeon, someone's spine experience. Then yeah. I say, you know what? I'll bite the bullets. So yeah. I decided I'm going to train some furthermore. Yes, I have some experience in spine surgery, yeah. but you know what? I'm going to look for another fellowship in spine. Yeah. I go home and tell my wife I'm applying for a spine fellowship, and she's like, done. You need to be serious. You need to make up your mind. What it is <laughs> you that you are do doing. Forever. I know you yeah. love academics for the academic, but you cannot do academics just for the sake of academics. Yeah. You cannot be a chronic student. You cannot be a chronic. But I say, you know what? It's it's trying to get that elusive final goal. Yeah. Anyway, so so, so I apply. Yeah. I apply and I get, get an orthopedic spine fellowship in London. So I moved back to London and I moved back the family to London. Oh my gosh. So again, from Scotland, we're back to London. We're back to London now. Yes. Oh my gosh. But you know what? I like the approach you took. You are looking at the population. What is the trend? Who are the guys who are coming? And I think sometimes we are so pushed in the direction of what am I passionate about? What, you know, what is it that, you know, I'm, I'm good at? But then also there's a lot to be said about, hey, what are the trends here? And how do I make a decision about which fellowship I'm going to invest in? So that's such a good pro tip. So now we're back. Sorry, go ahead. It's because you realize that you don't function in a vacuum. Mm. Yes, as an individual, you have goals, you have objectives, you have passions, you have desire, yeah. and you have things to follow. And yeah. that's great. And in an ideal world, yeah. follow that to the end of the line. Yeah. But then after that, all this, that skills, experiences, what you want, yeah. needs to be contextualized in the wider context of the society and where you live and where you are. Because that's the only way you fit in, and that's the way you provide a service to the community yeah. and to the society. And that's the only way then you also get feedback, reimbursement, and you also get an opportunity to make a difference.
so now three babies down with your wife we come back to london <laughs> oh, come back to london oh um, so this is a so i'm a neurosurgeon by training right uh, but spine is shared between neurosurgery and orthopedics right so i go into an orthopedic spinal training fellowship yeah so i turn up the first day i have my jeans on and I have a hoodie, and I'm meeting everyone and saying, hi, hi, my name is Dan. Yeah. And everyone is wondering, who's that crazy guy at the back? Yeah. So unknown to me, orthopedics are proper surgeons. They all go to the gym. They're all fit. They all have three pins. <laughs> three so it's not suits. just memes. It's not just memes. No. <laughs> no, it's not. Oh, all these guys are bros, and they're really, really... You know, top, they're all fit and they're all fancy. Yeah. I check in, all my consultants have fancy suits and they're all, you know, and I'm the guy who comes in with, ju- with jeans, sports shoes and a hoodie. <laughs> yes. And, you know, from the word, like, <laughs> who's this crazy guy at the back? Yeah. I'm like, yeah, I'm done. I'm the new fellow. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Let's just say I learned my lesson. Every day <laughs> after that, I was in scrubs because I couldn't afford the suits anyway. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I thought you were going to say you went to the gym. No, G- no. Ne, 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 ne. Ah, oh, see, you just said it. I'm staying in scrubs. <laughs> As a fellow, there's no time to go to the gym, right? I was like, yeah, maybe yeah. one day. <laughs> maybe one day. Because it sounds like but, it was super intense. No, it was intense. But but the orthopods have a very different culture. Neurosurgeons yeah. are a bit more, in as much as, I think neurosurgeons see a lot of pain and death. Mm. a lot of times yeah and we have this grim picture of life in as much yeah. as we help a, a bit yeah orthopod is more about functional and quality of life and making people a little bit better mm. so here everyone was bros everyone was going to games together yeah everyone you know what come for a barbecue and stuff and it's a big culture shift for me they were yeah. really really friendly yeah really really nice and I learned, it was not just the surgery and spinal surgery I learned for them. Yeah. It was how to be a good person, how to be a friend, how to be a colleague. Mm. And I think that reset, reset my mindset. It's the same way, like pediatricians, for example. Again, I don't yeah. know how the experience is <laughs> on that other side of the fence. But yes. my general impression was the pediatricians were, were relatively nice. Yeah, you know, we are. We, and, we, we are. Okay, I don't know as compared to, but I know pediatricians were 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 a really nice bunch. So nice. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to say I'm we're a really nice bunch. And everyone's like, <laughs> I know. Like, everyone says we're coochie coochie coo. Can I take you for breakfast? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. We're a nice bunch. <laughs> that, that's not the that's not the case in neurosurgery. Everyone is a bit of a pain, and everyone's very intense because it's either life and death, and yeah. even if it's not death, it's significant disability. Yeah. So everyone keeps on be getting bombarded by this negativity. It's high stakes. It takes a lot. Mm. Yeah, it takes a lot. But yes, they're very, very nice guys, and it just takes a lot for you to be actively disciplined to yeah. express love, express opportunity, and to be able to mentor and bring other people into your space. And so... How long was the Orthopedic Spine Fellowship? I did that for a year. So Orthopedic Spine concentrates on the bony aspect of things. Yeah. So if you have a fracture of the spine, if you have what we call displacement of the spinal spondylolisthesis, so that's what yeah. I learned from that, yes. from the program. Yeah. But then I wanted to be a whole round spinal surgeon. So I also needed to get and know what about tumors of the spine, know about tumors of the spinal cord and stuff like that. Yeah. So I ended up doing another spinal fellowship but this was a neurospine fellowship what <laughs> was it was it a so, fellowship within the fellowship or this is now another year after so this is another year after at this point my wife has given up on me she's like you know what do whatever you want you do whatever you want as long as we have stability so yeah. luckily yeah it was at the same hospital yeah so we didn't have to move this time okay so she was like you know we are not moving that's fine yeah. So, <laughs> same hospital, same location, and the yeah. kids are in school, mm-hmm. but just a, a different uh, department within the same hospital. So I decided to do an Eurospine fellowship. This was more focused on spinal cord tumors, spinal yeah. disorders, mm-hmm. but I also got to do more of the cranial side of stuff that had been uh, trained as a registrar as well. Yeah. And we were just going back home. It was more like a homecoming for me and just mm-hmm. getting to live what had actually brought me to the field. And, and yeah, it was, a, it was a good experience. So at this point, and maybe I've lost count, we are at tw- 12, 
No, wait. 10, 11, 12. I think we're at 12 and a half years of neurosurgery training. If you say it like that, it just makes it feel wrong. <laughs> no, I've been trying to tally as we've been going, you know, along. This is 12 and a half years of investing in terms of your skills so far. I started training in 2010. Right. We are now in 2023. So this yeah. is 13 years later. We're yeah. in 2024. Where were we? <laughs> <laughs> so, 2023, I did the Neurospine Fellowship. Then I'm like, you know what? Okay, I've, I've done my time, man. I, yeah. I either need to decide. I either get a consultant job in the UK yeah. or I go back home. I can't be, yes, it's been fun. It's been experience, but I can't be a fellow anymore. Yeah. I need to now start showing the results of all those fellowships. Right. It's okay to train and train and train and train, yeah. but there needs to be an output as a result of that training. Right. Otherwise, if you keep on training and keep it to yourself, mm. then it's not worth it. So, so I look around mm -hmm. and there's a consultant job that's advertised in Sheffield. So yeah. Sheffield is somewhere halfway in the United Kingdom. I apply for the job and they give me the job. Yeah. But it's a one year locum. So the UK is a bit strange. So they rarely give you a permanent job from the onset. Mm. They give you a locum job for a year. And then they see how you practice, how you interact with colleagues. Mm. And then at the end of the year, yeah. they decide, do you want to keep you permanently or you're not a good fit? Do you need to get somebody else? So I get this job for a year. Then I go back home. I tell the missus, you know what? I've been yeah. there for this job for a year. It's in Sheffield. Yeah. Um, can you guys come along with me? She's like, yeah. Dan, we followed you all this time. <laughs> no. Yes, now. We are, we are not, we are not moving. Because yeah. that means moving the kids from school, move stuff yeah. like that. I'm yeah. like, but it's a consultant job. Yeah. But then she's like, you know what? It's reasonable. Yeah, it's nice and it's good career provision and there's potential for it. But you also have to accept yeah. that, yes, the kids are still young and they can adapt. Right. But you have to be careful that you can't keep on moving them every year. Mm. Yes. Mm. So I get the Sheffield job yeah. as a consultant. Yeah. But then my family stays in London. Yeah. But that means then I have to every weekend travel between London and Sheffield. Wow. And that's, and that's what's been happening up until now? So that's been happening for the better part of a year. It's a very good unit. I've gotten a very, very good experience. They've been yes. very, very welcoming. Yeah. It was a place that I thought I would settle and I'd bring the family in. Yeah. But the NHS administrative wise is also very slow. Mm. So eight months into my consultant job, I start asking them, hey, guys, uh, I've been here for eight months. Yeah. Are you guys interviewing for the substantive of permanent position are there options right uh what do you guys think yeah and then i see keep on getting you know wait wait a minute we'll see we'll see we'll see we'll decide we'll see you need to talk to management yeah and stuff yeah so i speak to one of my friends he's like yeah we like you we think there'll be a job for you yeah but you need to be careful and yeah. make sure you have a plan b and a plan c yeah because in as much as a unit wants you or a department wants you, mm -hmm. you can never rely on the word of an individual and you yeah. need to look at what other opportunities are there. Right. And I'm like, hmm, that's strange. But let me look around. So I start looking around and I start applying for jobs elsewhere and stuff like that. Then I get an interview in Christchurch, New Zealand. I'm like, yeah. New Zealand, I need to look it up in the map. I've never been to New Zealand before. Right. I look it up in the map and I'm like, that's far? <laughs> but well, it's near Australia. It's not too bad. So I do the interview. Yeah. And then I get offered a permanent job. Wow. And then I come back to these guys and I say, look, I've been yeah. given a permanent job in New Zealand. Yeah. What's the state of the situation here? And they're like, oh my goodness, you've been offered a job? Okay, we need to work on this. We need to work on this. A yeah. week later, yeah. I get an offer on my current position. Wow. And then I learn one thing, that people treat you better yeah. Yeah. if you have other opportunities and other options. All right. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing. Never, never get indebted to one institution mm -hmm. or one individual. Mm -hmm. And as doctors, we get carried away. Oh, no, it's about the patient. It's about the career. Yeah. But you also need to realize that you need to also root for yourself. Yeah. And always try to make sure that what we're not taught in med school is how to negotiate for jobs, negotiate right. for careers, negotiate for embarkment, negotiate right. for gifts and stuff like that. 
Yeah. And that's a lot of things that if you speak guys who've done business management yeah. and stuff like that, they tell you that negotiation is definitely one of those things that you need to have. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So all of a sudden I have another offer mm-hmm. and then definitely things are moving and I'm getting a second offer where I am. And the question is then, do you be comfortable? Yeah. Are you happy to be in a place that gave you a chance only when they had so you got something else? Yeah. Or are you willing to try for something else? And it was yeah. a difficult, difficult decision. But I made the choice to uh, take the New Zealand job and I'll be uh, relocating again, I think, in another three, four months. Wow. Hopefully for the last time, though. Hopefully, Hopefully for, for the, the last, last time. time. For the sake of your uh, your your wife's sanity now. Hopefully. <laughs> it's for the last time. My wife doesn't want to see me now. Why? But hopefully for the last time. Hopefully for the last time. But then I, I really like how this has also been you walking us through learning and growing, not just as a clinician and in terms of your skills, but also just learning what it is to negotiate for yourself. The way you've said it, rooting for yourself, figuring out, okay, I'm actually the person who can make the decision here. It's not someone else sort of like pulling the strings. It's it's me coming and saying, hey, there's this. If you can't offer me something better, then, you know, it's it's my time to transition. And I have to say, Dan, I'm I'm really impressed at how flexible you are with the different life circumstances that have been coming at you that then help you make certain decisions. Because I know a lot of clinicians who are like, you know what, I, it's going to be too uncomfortable. It's going to be too hard to be able to transition or shift gears, you know, to be able to do this other thing. And so I really, I really admire that, Dan. Not many people are able to do that. So medicine conditions us to be malleable to the system. You know, uh, yeah. it's uh, med school, it's internship, it's right. MMed, it's yeah. senior registrar time, yeah. it's consultant, but then you have to work under somebody for a couple of years yeah. and hope that when he retires, then you get your chance. Yeah. And that sort of puts us in a box. Mm. And then you realize with time that, you know, you only have one life to live. Yeah. And you know what? Yes, you may make mistakes. Yeah. But you know what? It is fine to make mistakes. Yeah. It is okay to make mistakes as long Mm. as you learn from them, as Mm. long as you don't repeat them, Mm -hmm. and as long as it's a quality building experience. Yeah. And have I gotten all my decisions right? Absolutely not. Mm. I mean, I've I've, I've messed up a couple of times. Mm -hmm. Uh, As I told you, when I quit my South African job, yeah. Would I have done it a little bit different, maybe? Yeah. And that should have eased my transition, but I learned from it. Again, at this time, would it be comfortable to stay in the UK? Probably. But then you always look at the potential and you always look at what is in it for the future. Yeah. And you just try your best. As long as one day you'll be able to look back and say, you know what? I tried yeah. my best. Yeah. This worked out. This didn't work out. It's fine. Yeah. Hey, Dan, today, you know the way... On the one hand, I know you and I have not seen each other in such a long time, but then also it's been such a rich life between you, you, yourself in terms of your self-growth and then also in terms of your marriage, you and your wife parenting while learning. And I'm so, so glad we were able to get the time. And I'm so humbled that you were able to share these experiences with us on this safari. What would be your one piece of advice to that person who's doing a fellowship and is trying to figure out, do I continue down this path or do I switch or do I take this other opportunity that I was applying for? What would be your parting shot i think the one thing is the world is your oyster the world is your map you have a lot of opportunities more than you think yeah the main thing for me would be looking back 5 10 20 years yeah would you be able to live with the decision that you did would you have a regret for throwing the line or would you rather have a sense of adventure mm. experiment try fail yeah. or yeah. succeed okay and in the end, you also need to enjoy the journey. And it's not just the destination. Enjoy the journey, enjoy the life, enjoy the experience mm-hmm. and make friends, pursue opportunities mm-hmm. and don't be held back by your fears. Mm-hmm. There's a whole world out there yeah. and it's, it's, it's ripe for the picking. It's ripe for the picking. 
yeah. and especially as a Kenyan or an African or as a fellow, yeah. uh, you are worth more than you think you are. And there's definitely, definitely a slot for you in the workplace or in the world. Thank you so much, Dan. That, especially that part of your Kenyan, your African, there's a place for you in this world to make an impact. I am so grateful for every single morsel of information, of experience, of nuggets of wisdom that you've shared with us. And we would want to hear back from you, our listeners, about the things that Dan has shared. And, you know, let us know what you think. Let us know, you know, any additional, you know, things that you'd want to find out in terms of the neurosurgery world. And we'll try and see if we can get some information to you. I'm also hoping that Dan can be able to share with us an email address or a social media handle that, you know, someone can be able to reach him directly. And I'll hopefully put that in the notes so that if somebody has any additional questions, questions, they can be able to address them directly with, with you, Dan, if that's okay. 100%. I'm reachable. I'm available for any questions or any contact. Yeah. Uh, I'm on Twitter or X as it's now known. So yeah. if you just Google Cheng MD, then yes. I, I'm happy to get in touch with anyone. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, And with that, our dear listener, we'd like to bring this to a close. And until next time, bye. I'm so glad you stayed tuned. Please get the word out and share it with at least three people. Make this episode like a chain letter. Share it, share it, share it. Come back for the next leg of our safari where we'll be talking about... The first thing is to really know what you want. Many people don't know what they want. They're unhappy about where they are, but if you ask them what is it that you want, they don't know. You must know what you want. Mm -hmm. Then... You must ask yourself, who are you? What's it about you? Listeners are advised to use their own judgment and discretion when applying any information discussed in this and all podcast episodes to their specific situation. Always seek the advice of a qualified professional if you have any concerns or questions regarding a particular subject matter. You can find this and other episodes of this podcast on our website at www.fellowshipsafaris.org. You can also find all our episodes on all podcast platforms. Reach out to us on social media as Fellowship Safaris on Facebook, Instagram and TikTok. And our Twitter handle is at Fellowships Afar. You could also send us an email on fellowshipsafaris at gmail.com. We look forward to hearing from you and interacting with what you have to say about the Fellowship Safaris podcast. It takes a village to make this podcast. The executive producer and original music is done by Mokavi Maweu. The sound engineer is Tevin Sudi with thanks to AQ Studios. Graphic design was done by Benjamin Mboya. We would like to give a special shout out to Josephine Karianjahe and Melissa Mbogwa of Africa Podfest. All rights reserved by Dr. Jerry Karianjahe and the Fellowship Safaris podcast. <laughs>